Hi, everyone, and welcome to the launch of our latest issue of the NACWA report, Solo Pueblo, Salvo el Pueblo. Uh, thank you all for joining. It looks like some folks are still trickling in. Um, thanks in advance to our speakers, and thanks also to our partner on this event, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at New York University. My name is Heather Geese. I'm managing editor of the NACLA report. And if you're new to NACLA, NACLA, the uh, North American Congress on Latin America, is a nonprofit based in New York City that began publishing anti imperialist news and analysis on Latin America and the Caribbean in 1967 following the US invasion of the Dominican Republic. And for more than 50 years, NACLA has remained a leading source of information on Latin America and US Latin American relations. You can follow that coverage on our website, NACLA.org, as well as in our quarterly print magazine. If you're interested in the magazine, if you sub subscribe now before the end of October, you can get our latest issue on the pandemic and public health, um, which is the topic of our conversation today, as well as the three other issues we put out this year, um, which is one on rethinking US foreign policy, in Latin America, one on the idea of a Green New Deal in the Americas, and a forthcoming issue, our last of this year, um, dedicated to Central America. Uh, we also have student rates available, so check out our website uh, for more information on subscriptions, and if you have any questions, you can always uh, drop us a line. So on to our event today. Uh, we'll begin with a poetry reading by Anna Portnoy Brimmer, uh, then our moderator and guest editor of this most recent issue, Adriana Garilla Lopez, uh, who's Associate Professor of Anthropology at Kalamazoo College in Michigan, will facilitate a conversation with all of our participants on uh, the pandemic, organizing, labor, public health surveillance, and uh, I'm sure much more. Uh, so we're thrilled to also be joined by Shakti Castro, Joanna Fernandez, Chris Garces, and Edgar Rivera Colon, who all contributed to this latest issue of the magazine. We'll also have time for questions from the audience, so please feel free to submit your questions uh, at any time throughout the conversation using the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom screen. I'd also like to note that this event is being recorded and it will be made available on NACLA's YouTube channel afterwards. Um, we'll be sharing that on our social media and in our newsletter, so you can always follow us there. So thanks once again for everyone for being here. And uh, I would like to introduce Anna. Anna Portner Brimmer is a Puerto Rican poet, performer, and organizer. Uh, the poems she'll be reading today uh, were published in English in the magazine and she'll be reading in English, but they're also available in Spanish on NACLA's website, NACLA.org. So I do encourage you to check those out there if you're interested. So thanks everyone and over to you, Anna. Thank you, Heather. Buenas noches, good evening. I, before anything, I wanted to thank Adriana and Heather and Nestor and all of the NACLA team um, for putting all of this together and bringing us together here tonight. I hope people can hear me okay. Um, the first poem I'll be sharing um, plays with and problematizes uh, the language, legal flame, framework, and coloniality of the executive orders issued by Governor Juan Vázquez here in Puerto Rico and the mismanagement of the coronavirus pandemic during which executive orders have been issued obsessively, um, but there's been no bother with public health and safety and community-centered policy. So the poem is entitled Executive Order Administrative Bulletin Number OE 2020-051. This second phase will continue the lethal reopening of various economic sectors and other purposes related to the measures taken to control the spread of colonia virus, COVID-20 in Puerto Rico. Whereas maintaining social distancing measures is an individual task that each person is responsible for. The government will not be responsible for infections contracted outside of the regulations of this executive order. The government will not be responsible for infections contracted. The government will not be responsible. Section 1. Lockdown. A lockdown remains in effect in Puerto Rico, extending through June 15, 2020, or if need be, until the end of the colonia virus. Individuals may leave their shelter between 5 a.m. and 7 p.m. exclusively under the following circumstances here and below and wearing a face mask. One, to go to a medical appointment, hospitals, or laboratories. Two, 
to purchase food or essential supplies with possibility of arrest. Three, if you're the governor of Puerto Rico with a beach house in Fajardo. Four, if you're president of the Senate on your way to a, fas a fascist mustache trim. Six, if you play dirty with antibody tests from Australia or federal aid. Seven, if you're on your way to shut down school lunchrooms. Eight, sigisas with yautia, earthquakes, and pandemic. Nine, if you're a police officer without a mask and with a baton. Section two, beauty salons. Beauty salons will resume operations along with pet grooming services. drive through molecular testing stations for pets will be opened in every municipality. We are still experiencing setbacks with testing sites and contact tracing systems for the general public. We estimate the brief period of one year for their establishment. Section three. Beaches. Beaches will open strictly for exercise, sports, and activities such as running, cycling, surfing, swimming, avoiding the police, or taking selfies if you're a gringue, tourist, or blanquite from Guaynao or Condado. Entering the water is allowed, but beach coolers are forbidden. Playing music, sitting, buying pinchos, stopping to admire the scurrying crab, or drawing on the sand are prohibited. It is not a day trip. You must always remain in motion. You must always wear your mask. You must trot like a horse by the shore. If you get in the water, make like a shark, swim in circles, maintain six feet of distance and your mask on nice and tight. Section four, naval distancing. Social distancing orders for yachts are being issued. The distance between yachts must surpass 15 feet. For San Juan, Fajardo, and Mayagüez, yachts must greet each other at this distance and return to the same marine from which they set sail. Caracoles K will only have turns of 10 yachts per hour. Section 5, restaurants. Restaurants will open at 25% capacity. Workers will operate at 100% capacity. Employers will pocket 99% of profits. If your employer calls you to work and you refuse, you will not be eligible to receive unemployment. If your employer calls you to work and you contract the virus, you will be held responsible and will not be eligible to receive unemployment. If your employer calls you to work, you accept and are injured or die, you will not be eligible to receive unemployment, but your family will receive an additional $500 incentive. Your death will not be included in the COVID-20 mortality statistics for Puerto Rico. Business's protective equipment will be its workers. Workers' protective equipment will be the grace of God. Amen. Section six, public debt. The PUA, PAN, unemployment insurance, federal stimulus checks, the loose change from the University of Puerto Rico's vending machines, car tags, lottery sales, and the pennies in the water fountains of public plazas in every town will be redirected towards the payment of the public debt. Section seven, civil code. Contrary to this reopening, the civil code will not be open for discussion, objections, or amendments. The civil code will remain in indefinite quarantine under the custody and bed of Tata Charbonnier. Section eight, noncompliance. In the event of noncompliance with the provisions contained, penal sanctions and fines established by the provisions of La Guarevel will be implemented. Imprisonment for up to six months or a fine of up to $5,000. Infections contracted during the hospital for treatment. We are still working on establishing protocol for the latter. Fines do not exempt individuals from mortgage payments, rent payments, utility payments, car payments, phone payments, health insurance payments, loan and or debt payments. Section nine, the virus will continue to be productive. Section 10, publication. This executive order must be filed immediately with the Department of State and the widest possible implementation is hereby ordered. In testimony whereof, I hereby issue this executive order under the rule of my mask and stamp the murderous seal of the government of Puerto Rico. And I will finish my reading with um, one more very short poem, uh, the other one that was published in the issue. Um, Puerto Rico has been under curfew due to the coronavirus pandemic, and this is a dictatorial strategy, no? um, but since March, um, and it can be claimed that Puerto Rico has been under curfew since Hurricane Maria, which was three years ago, and it's been under a colonial state of exception for much, much longer. Um, and so this poem um, 
contemplates curfew and its unbridled extension. The poem is entitled Juan da Vasquez Stretches Curfew. Juan da Vasquez stretches curfew like gum stretched between two mouths, like between two mouths a tongue, like a tongue polishing teeth, like a tongue peeking out under rainfall, like a power line from Guayama to San Juan, power line that wavers, snaps under branch or gale, like an ilang ilang branch through salt sky, like a salt sky delated with heat, like a pupil delated with desire, like desire lengthened over calls, countries, years, like childish countries doodling borders, like childish countries displacing them, like a child of a low tide and long haired summer, like a summer of insurrections, earthquakes, pandemics, like a pandemic around the planet, like a planet expanding and contracting, slackening its science, like the narrowness of upcountry to tar road, like a road that winds until reaching the sea, like a sea that expands until reaching land, like rows of freshly tilled land, like rows of sunflowers, like your hand giving me sunflowers, like your hand in my hand and my hand in her hand and her hand in his hand and their hand, like a hand seashelled into fist fighting for more, like an island looking to be more, like more fearing less, like fear in the face of colonialism, like the streets when we've run out of fear, like the street when the clock strikes curfew and we're still here. Juan da Vasquez stretches curfew and it's only a matter of time before it breaks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm really appreciative that you were here with us today. And I know you have to take off, but uh, you're welcome to hang out as, as long as you can and take off whenever you need to. We're just grateful that you're able to read those poems for us. And um, yeah, thank you so much. So welcome everyone. Um, it's great to be here with you. It's really a privilege, um, not only to have Anna with us, but all the authors that are with us today from the uh, NACLA special issue on COVID-19 in the Americas. We had a previous event a couple of weeks ago that was in Spanish. And um, as Heather mentioned, some of the essays are published in Spanish um, uh, for free, uh, free access in, on the NACLA website. So we had a, a great conversation that Ana also participated in. And, um, uh, we kind of talked about mutual aid in Puerto Rico and, and feminism in Latin America more broadly and um, had a really wonderful conversation. Um, but uh, today's is in English and this, um, I'm hoping that we will be able to kind of uh, make some connections, right? Some Do some connecting of dots between some of these wonderful essays that you all have written. Um, and then I have uh, been so fortunate to be able to um, to work with and um, obviously, I think there's connections between all of the essays um, and uh, there's a, under this shared experience of the global pandemic, right, of COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that um, stands out, I think, from the context is that, that, that some of us are more aware of than others is that the COVID-19 pandemic is happening in the context of an already existing global pandemic. Uh, which is a pandemic of, of HIV AIDS, right? And that is a, uh, a condition that has become um, chronic in many first world contexts for people who have access to biomedicine and antiretrovirals, but that is still um, acute and can, you know, kills people um, who don't have access to treatment um, and still experience um, HIV infection as, uh, as an emergency, right? So, so that was one of the, the starting places, I think, for, for myself and I know for Heather also thinking about previous work that, um, that NACLA has published on HIV AIDS in the Americas, right, and thinking about the interaction of those, of those um, two pandemics. And I wanted to start by asking Edgar to, um, to reflect a little bit on the conversation that he had with 
um, the HIV activist and um, academic and artist, Pato Ebert, who's not able to be with us today, but was part of this um, conversation that Edgar and he had. Um, that was just so instructive and beautiful for me in terms of thinking about what the lessons learned from HIV and HIV activism are for our communities today. So I wonder if you would get us started, Edgar. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Adriana, and thank you, Heather, and thank you, uh, David, and uh, the other comrades here on the, on the panel. And of course, Anna's brilliant poem. Uh, it's, it's good to begin that way. Um, I'm, I'm going to begin with a little story and then talk about the conversation with Pato um, a, a bit. And, um, and I want to think about um, the question of counterinsurgency uh, because a lot of the, the things that I see in COVID-19 is a continuation of, of sets of actions, uh, what I call allopathic counterinsurgency, uh, the regular kind. And, and I actually got involved with HIV AIDS because two of my cousins who had served in the Vietnam War um, came back. Uh, they were, you know, injecting and their wives died uh, first and then they died. And uh, they're Jersey Ricans. And that actually uh, connected with me on some level, probably because the, the cousins would have to be raised by grandparents. And uh, both of them, of course, uh, were Vietnam veterans, uh, had been, uh, been combat veterans in Vietnam. And I think there's a continuity uh, there. There's a rupture, but there's a continuity in the sense that what we saw in the AIDS crisis, those of us who were involved in sort of the Latinx and Black uh, movement around AIDS in New York City, um, what we saw was a set of practices that had uh, produced stigma as a structure, right, and shame. And we sort of had a fight against that. But we also, I mean, and this is where where I think Pato, George Ayala, Jaime Cortez, and other people uh, were able to push and think about what are the resources available to us uh, that wouldn't be reductive, that wouldn't be based upon the question of the individual unit of behavior, right? I remember doing a focus group with Black Latinx, uh, you know, LGBTQ folks early on in the crisis or earlier on the crisis. And basically they said that, you know, we did not, we all, we did, we said, well, why are their messages failing, right? And they said, well, you guys don't just talk about sex. You don't talk about love. You don't talk about creativity. You don't talk about spirit. And, you know, you know, from a Marxist perspective, I said, oh, these are sort of unalienated or less alienated sectors of life. And I think what Pato and I were trying to talk about was to think about the question of, of this constant racialized biopolitical class war that our folks throughout the Americas have been subject to from jump. And the kind of resources that people develop, you know, to confront that at the level of health. Now, ahora, public health is many things. Right? Uh, it has a grassroots aspect, it has an organizing aspect, but also it's a form of governance, right? It's a form of neoliberal governance. And as some of the articles in the, in the uh, edition that we you just put out, Nakla put out, it's clear that there's a set of, of desires around digital surveillance that are being mobilized as public health interventions that begin in the logic of prisons. Hmm? Um, and so there's this, this dialectic that we constantly have to think about, about public health is how much are you actually rearticulating public health as a strategy of containment, of dispersion, right? And I think one of the, the things that we were trying to think about what is what are other traditions that can, indigenous traditions, African traditions, healing traditions, uh, modes of, if you will, warfare, uh, popular warfare, popular warfare, warfare from below, right? And activity from below that can counter arrest that, can create spaces. And I think that we're in a period where the political geography of the body of, uh, of people, if you will, is being remapped. 
and it's precisely through COVID-19. Either in its incompetent version, right, or its more competent versions, right? And that's not saying there shouldn't be public health interventions, but what we learned in the AIDS process or the question of organizing around AIDS was that we had to become experts in the sciences or whatever in order to rearticulate them, right? I always want, I always remember that, um, that quote from uh, 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 Sam Bennett, uh, the, uh, the African filmmaker who said that, you know, when he decided to use the camera, he realized that was a hostile technology, that he had to deconstruct it in order to use it. Osmanis and Bene. And I think that there's a piece where we're trying to figure out for ourselves in that conversation, Pato and I, and, and the comrades that we had that died, that were in the struggle and died in that process, um, what could we offer, right? And, and the, the framing of the like slow burn, humid pitch, the, uh, the, the connection of those two things. Um, so I think that one of the things I would say right now is that we're in a pivot we're in a, a, if you will, civilizational turn, um, and that this is uh, way beyond the capacity of the settler state to handle the carbon-based settler state, right, in the Americas, which is the template, right, of the state in the Americas. So uh, we'll see what's going to happen in this country in November. Um, I'm sure all hell will break loose one way or the other. Pero and I mean, my, right? At the same time, uh, as my father used to say, I quote him in the piece is, más se perdió en la guerra. More has been you know, lost in the war. What war? The constant war, race, class, gender wars that we're in as a people throughout the Americas, right? I'm watching some of the stuff that's coming in from Argentina right now, the kind of brutal impositions that are occurring. So I think that the conversation was between two people who were militants, who are militants, and we're having conversations about what are possibilities. Now, ahora, now, right? That conversation occurred before the national rebellions around Black Lives Matter. That's right. I remember you, when you posted the article on your social media, you made that qualification. You said, I yeah. wrote this before before yeah. the Black Lives Matter uprising. But, right. but I, 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 think I find what you're saying very suggestive also in terms of you know, what I've been thinking of as a kind of seizing the means of, of health, uh, and the sense of seizing the means of production of health, right? And that, that, that makes me um, think, of course, of the Young Lords and the takeover of the Lincoln Hospital and the, the takeover also of the TB clinic that, that they drove around, um, which actually I have a poem about, which I, I shared with Joanna excitedly when, when we first started communicating. <laughs> I was like, read my poem. <laughs> So uh, anyway, but I find that I've always found that idea very, very compelling, right? That sense of like, as you say, Edgar, also learning to, to engage with the science and engage with technology and sort of those different kinds of revolutionary literacies, if you will, uh, including health literacies no? uh, and community literacy. So Joanna, I, I wonder if you could share with us a little bit um, kind of like what you've been thinking about since you wrote your piece. If you, I assume you've continued to sort of um, to think about that legacy of the Young Lords for the present moment. Maybe you can share something about that with us. I think you have to unmute yourself first. Yes. There you go. I'm thinking about what Edgar has shared with us um, and the this theme of uh, folks having to become experts is a, uh, a constant historical theme. Uh, I just interviewed a series of teachers here in New York City uh, and in New York, there's been an open, we're gonna open, we're not gonna open, we're gonna open. And the teachers themselves, as they think about exposing um, the young but also older teachers to the virus, they've had to figure out the science. Um, and that's one of the things that came, uh, came up in that interview. And it was fascinating because it wasn't just that I know what might happen, but, but people get really steeped in the science and they don't get paid for that extra work. Um, I'm just thinking about the themes that you raised, health as containment um long history of that 
thinking about Puerto Rico being a laboratory for, um, for the pill and port the bodies of Puerto Rican women. Um, and uh, beyond what you've shared, I, I'm thinking as, as, as just in response that, that this health crisis is, um, is, is a reflection of the crisis of the state, but the health crisis also speaks of possibilities and we've seen them. So for example, there was a mini explosion in labor up, upsurge and activism during the pandemic, which we have not seen in any consistent way in this country in some time. Uh, so those are some random thoughts uh, in, in conversation with, um, with Edgar's uh, observation. And I really love that dialogue. It was so rich, um, you had. So what can we learn from the young lords? Um, I think that uh, it's not easy to, to talk about the Young Lords, and it is. We can never say that what worked in the past can work in the present. Uh, the Young Lords were effective because they tapped into the ethos of the moment. They had their finger on the pulse of the moment politically and aesthetically. Um, but there are some things that we can learn. And I think that uh, anti-communism in this country has made standing up for values and principles unequivocally something that few people do. We defend healthcare sometimes with trepidation. And what the Young Lords did was that they organized locally around specific grievances. Um, the fact that a Puerto Rican woman, for example, the first woman to get an abortion after the, um, the, the law was uh, established that abortions were legal in uh, New York State this woman, Carmen Rodriguez, was the first person to die. Uh, and so the Young Lords humanized that story. Why did she die? She died because the doctor who performed the abortion didn't look at her, um, at her record, nor did the doctor consult with her before the abortion or even ask her questions. How are you feeling? Do you have any pre-existing conditions? Um, and out of that emerged what is known as the continuity clinic in public hospitals across the country, the notion that patients should not, poor patients should not be seen by revolving door, a revolving door of, of doctors. But beyond that, so they addressed the local, but beyond that, they stood on principle for um, healthcare as a human right. And they sang it from a mountaintop. They were unequivocal. Um, they used the media to amplify their message. They exposed the contradictions of the system. And they spoke about healthcare as a human right in very common sense ways. Um, they mastered the propaganda of liberation. And I feel that that's something that we need to do today. Um, we need to master the propaganda of liberation because there is a struggle over what ideas are going to dominate uh, and be popular in American society. And we can't be mealy mouthed about what we believe and in many ways, ironically, for a very long time, the right has, um, has somehow cornered the market on morality, right? So the right has cornered the, the, the market on morality, but really, historically, morality is, is with us. We are the ones who amplify the left 
um, the highest aspirations um, of humanity and this notion of human rights for all. So I think that's something that the Young Lords just did in their literature, uh, in their media work, and they, uh, they, they performed with creativity. The fact that they took over um, a TV truck and flew the Puerto Rican flag on it um, they took over Lincoln Hospital and they wore white coats while doing it. Um, when, and I wrote this in the article, when I was living through uh, this apocalypse in New York City, we were, I mean, there are quite a number of us uh, who were here in New York City, I thought, if the Young Lords were around today, they would have had parallel press conferences alongside of Governor Cuomo and um, the president. A counter narrative, a consistent counter narrative and the Young Lords didn't have one press conference. They had press conferences every day. In fact, they used the new media, which was television um, and exploited it to the max to amplify their message beyond their numbers. Uh, and again, as I was looking at these, um, at these press conferences, which were happening every day because of the crisis, something we never see, it dawned on me that the young lords were actually having press conference every day because they argue that Puerto Ricans and Black Americans live in a perpetual state of crisis, ongoing. And so we need a press conference to amplify the health crises um, of all kinds. Um, and I think that the fact that they um, I think this was particular not to the young lords, but the, to the people of the period. Mm -hmm. There were manifestos written mm -hmm. daily. What do we stand for? Uh, and they had a health, a 10 point health program and that wasn't enough. And at Lincoln Hospital, they drafted uh, the Patient Bill of Rights, which is the first known <laughs> document to articulate patient advocacy and um, translation and interpretation as a right. Um, and finally, I'll just say that, uh, and by the way, that, that was the one that stuck. Their 10 point health program didn't stick, but the other one they wrote, they drafted, was the one that is now replicated across, um, across the, the uh, the world, if not the country. This is the last thing I'll say, and I wrote this in my, uh, in my, in my essay, which is that there was a lot of talk of pre-existing conditions, and the talk about pre-existing conditions uh, and COVID really uh, sounded like uh, the notion that Black people and Latinos, Black Americans, that is, um, are somehow sicker and dying disproportionately because they're biologically predisposed to illness because of race. That's what it sounded like. And the Young Lords would have argued that there's something called diseases of poverty, a term they adopted from the Cubans. Mm -hmm. um, and they would probably have had a series of press conferences identifying racism and poverty as a health care crisis or a health crisis of epic proportion. So they talked about the dilapidated hospitals and the conditions under which folks work uh, as a pre-existing condition that will make you sick, that will give you diabetes and heart attack and hypertension. So they identified the root causes of health crises. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but about three months ago, 
uh, after the pandemic, the uh, New York Times, in fact, wrote that, well, it seems that those patients who ended up at ruling class hospitals, they survived regardless of race. Mm -hmm. A big revelation, big revelation <laughs> that the condition of the, pa of the hospital you arrived uh, it at or in when you fell ill with COVID was going to determine whether you were going to live or die. And because of racism and poverty in cities like New York, this meant that immigrants in Queens and Puerto Ricans and Dominicans uh, in the Bronx uh, were, were dying in, in dilapidated hospitals. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing all of that, Joanna. You made me, I could imagine uh, sort of cinematically uh, things that you were describing. And um, it made me think also of the demands in Puerto Rico from the Colectiva Feminista en, Constru en Construcción and others that have been calling for a declaration of a state of emergency around gender violence in Puerto Rico uh, and the ways in which that has been a, an ongoing demand, right, to acknowledge this um, state of emergency. Um, and similar calls that came actually from Black Lives Matter and, and, um, and BLM sort of movement um, related groups um, to, to talk about racism as a public health emergency uh, and to talk about police brutality and, and violence um, as a, as a pre-existing condition, if you will, right, as, a, as an emergency, as a, as a public health emergency. Um, and, and Edgar, you know, feel free to, to sort of jump in here and also comment about, you know, what, how your essay would have been different if, uh, if it had happened after <laughs> all the big demonstrations, right? But I wanted to ask Shakti because she was, she addressed this directly in her, in her article. I wanted to ask um, if, uh, Shakti to jump in here and sort of um, share with us some, some reflections about the ways in which um, these discourses circulated and the ways in which class was so drawn out by this category of essential worker, right? The way in which the, there was a kind of new language created to talk about class through this category of the essential worker. Um, so Shakti, you wanna share some thoughts with us? So I think the way that Edgar framed it, that public health is a form of governance, is, is a really great way of putting that. Um, you know, we see in this country that we're dealing with a disease that's been racialized from the outset in terms of who it's coming from, who's bringing it here. Um, the language that's used to describe it, it's racist, it's xenophobic, you know, it's disproportionately impacting our communities, black and brown communities. and. You know, the idea of public health surveillance, you know, this is something that goes back in this country to the 18th century. Globally, it goes back. It's supposed to be a public good to keep us healthy, to keep us well. And, you know, it's become historically and very much currently with the COVID pandemic, the basis of policing. What is done in the name of public health has been targeted policing of communities of color. Um, you know, this sort of enhanced scrutiny on the part of the state endangers people for following or not following public health guidelines. You know, there are many stories that have arisen in the news of black and brown men wearing facial coverings, um, you know, being asked to take them off, being asked to leave spaces because they're being criminalized. There are also instances of people being removed from public transportation. Uh, a black man in Philadelphia was removed from a bus by four police officers. A young mother was harassed in New York's uh, Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the subway, because of not wearing a mask. And I think we're seeing a framing of contagion and disease that's centered in communities. And just like Joanna said, you know, people of color are not inherently sicker, they're sicker because of the circumstances that surround them, the circumstances that are created for us to live in that don't allow us to, to have the most health or to have access to the best resources to keep ourselves healthy. And, you know, when you look at the numbers of people who are getting sick, you know, something came out in the news just a few weeks ago about Co-op City in the Bronx, which is a, a big housing conglomeration of co-op apartments that many 
Black and Latinx folks live in, and many of them have been essential workers. You know, they suffered great infection rates there. I think upwards of 125 to 150 people may have died there. You know, we live in multi-generational homes. Um, black and brown folks in New York City often don't have access to the kinds of jobs that allow them to work from home. You know, everywhere you go, diseases of poverty is today what we would term the social determinants of health. We don't have access to what could keep us healthy and safe. And it's this sort of benign neglect on the part of the federal government, right? They don't have to do anything. They're doing nothing that allows us to remain in the state of crisis that we're in, where we don't have the testing that we need. The contact tracing is flawed and we're suffering for it. We can see that from the high rates of infections and deaths that started rolling out in May, in April and May. And, you know, it's no coincidence that when those numbers started to be publicized nationally, that so many of these protests against the lockdown started, right? And if we look at those protests, they are predominantly white. These are white men with guns in places like the Michigan State Capitol who are threatening the governor, who are threatening elected officials who are doing their best with very few resources to, to keep people safe and they wanna reopen the economy. And it's no mistake that that comes on the heels of this news that black and brown folks are more impacted by this disease. And it's very much a statement of we don't care because it's not us. And if you look at how you know, these protesters, these white protesters have been framed by the media and how they've been treated by law enforcement, there's such an intense difference between the way they've been treated and the way Black Lives Matter protesters have been treated in the wake of George Floyd's killing. You know, that's not an accident. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing that, uh, Shakti. And I think, you know, we all started to get that chilling sense at a certain point, right, when it became obvious that the pandemic was having um, this very deeply racialized effect. Uh, I think many of us started feeling that paranoid feeling of that uh, this neglect is completely intentional. No? Um, so does anybody else want to make a comment about, you know, how, how um, Black Lives Matter and the, the massive protests that happened over the summer shifted this question of organizing or shifted the question of um, community activism? Um, anybody want to jump in? Can you reframe the question? Sure. I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, most of you were writing this um, before the summer. So uh, just, as, uh, just as the protests began, we were doing um, revisions, I think. And so there were some of you who were able to kind of include some thoughts and comments about Black Lives Matter and the, the, the protests specifically of this summer uh, and how they, how they reflected you know, the way that uh, COVID-19 had affected the, the communities of color in the United States uh, and elsewhere, right? So I just I just wonder if if and if want to sort of that we're in this topic of thinking about um, uh, the police brutality and criminalization and and, uh, and and racialization. I wondered if anybody else wanted to kind of think through um, the pandemic and and in relationship to to this particular you know very large burst of activism. I think we're talking about the largest protests in the history of the United States. So in the in the middle of a pandemic, so you know it, it sort of just change the changes the panorama as far as um, activism goes, you know, because even if I think about like the ACT UP uh, protest, right? Though the footage that I've seen, I personally was never at an ACT UP protest, but the footage that I've seen, there was a lot of risk involved and a lot of um, bravery and and also um, symbolism. But there wasn't the sense that you know we could infect each other just from being together, just from you know being in the same protest together, sharing space together. So it seemed like you know it, it just added another kind of powerful layer of 
of relationality for people to, to, to go out in the streets and assume the risk of police violence and criminalization, but also the risk of, you know, potential contamination. So it just, you know, I was thinking about that and I wondered if somebody else wanted to say something about it, but if not, we can move well, on. Well, no, I think, I think what's fascinating about the protest, and this was written about in uh, some paper, uh, it's fascinating that the protesters distributed masks more effectively than the government. So if you wanted to go to a place that was uh, pretty uh, strict about, about safety, that was a protest, ironically. And I think this has been um, said before, and I think that Shakti alluded to it. I think that um, the absolute failure of the state and the barbarism exhibited by the government uh, petrified the country and the world. We, we it, it was as if the pandemic put a mirror in the face of the horror that is empire um, and racialized capitalism. And yes, there was a, that, that statement by a, an elected official in Texas uh, who said that maybe people should sacrifice their lives um, and so that the so that the economy would continue to flourish um, and clearly that was uh, that was code for we don 't need uh, to be too worried about the folks who are being infected who are disproportionately poor people of color and the elderly. Mm -hmm. That kind of um, inhumane response to, to mortality, I think radicalized people without them knowing. And the horrors in Minneapolis um, and beyond with Breonna Taylor just galvanized people to do something. It was, it was the perfect storm in many ways. A and the multi-racial character then and the multi-ethnic character of these demonstrations was also uh, quite phenomenal. I know that we organized, we organized uh, a demonstration here, a solidarity demonstration, uh, Latinx and Afro-Latinos in solidarity with Black Americans. And when we marched through East Harlem, there were many possibly Mexican immigrants, likely undocumented, on the sidelines clapping. So, so it really, it just, it just brought the contradictions of this, of this society to a head and it connected race and class in ways um, previously un unseen in this particular manner. Thanks so much, Joanna. Um, it's uh, definitely, it's also brought out the geography, at least the, the sort of the initial, um, the initial outbreaks in, in New York really brought out the geography of New York City also, right? And the, the difference between the Bronx and and uh, Lower Manhattan was was quite stark. Also, in terms of um, those those geographies, became even more visible at the local level as well as at the at the national and and even global level, right? Um, and and that that leads me to um, the question that I wanted to uh, kind of direct at at Chris uh, before we then open up and and take some questions from the audience. I think I see some folks are are putting some stuff in the chat, so. Definitely want to leave time for that, but I, I wanted to ask Chris um, to jump in because there you offer a really interesting conceptual framework, I think, in your piece um, for thinking about what you call epidemiological elites, mm -hmm. um, and you know that seems to me to be a little bit also what Joanna is is pointing towards, right? The the reaction against the epidemiological elites um, enacting um, this kind of uh, 
you know, genocidal neglect, right? Uh, and 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 also what Joanna was talking about now in relationship to to the reaction to this kind of lack of respect for the dead or lack of respect for mortality also reminds me of, of many conversations that we've been having about the summer of 2019 in Puerto Rico and the ways in which um, the, the disrespect for the dead of Maria, right, the people who died after the Hurricane Maria, how that was a big motivating factor that unified people on the street in ways that have never happened before in Puerto Rico politically. So, um, so I find that very, very interesting. Um, and there's a lot more to say there, uh, but you know, Chris, your piece was pretty hard to read uh, just because of what it recounts is, yeah. um, you know, a lot of suffering uh, involved in that. So, but I, but I did think that these, that, the, that you offered us some, some good ways of thinking about it in terms of, you know, your, your notion of epidemiological elites and, uh -huh. um, yeah, and, and all oh, the stuff that you want. So can you say more, please? Sure, well, you know, thanks. Thank, thanks for the prompt, Adriana. I, I, really, my piece in a, in a sort of um, is a nice dance partner with uh, Ed, some of Edgar's uh, frames. Um, to the extent that, uh, you know, I, 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 I tacitly I'm using a, the, a, um, a concept developed gosh, over 30 years ago by Paul Rabinow called, called biosociality within, within uh, you know, medical anthropology, where he argues that, where he was looking around uh, at the late 80s, frankly, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, one of the AIDS epicenters, saying that, you know, in the future, social movements, sub subjectivity, and forms of identification increasingly developed around biomedical categories and, and associations vis-a-vis -vis, like biomedical categories. So, you know, I, I developed this notion of the of immunological elites as kind of like the, the necessary uh, like pair, pairing for the essential worker, uh, like a necessary sort of dyadic that's implied by the notion of the, of the essential worker uh, for reasons which I'll explain in, in a few minutes when I talk about my own piece, but I think it's quite, useful to, 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 uh, to think with. You, I mean, we could call them epidemiological elites or immunological elites. I, I'm, not quite, I'm not quite certain on the, on the proper tag, uh, but, um, you know- the, Sorry the, if I got that wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. You know, epidemiological, but you know, this is a kind of like, uh, this is a, the notion where, where, where socioeconomic class maps onto political economy and notions of, notions of freedom, the epidemiological elites are, are, are those who, uh, who have the capacity to stay put, to, to self-quarantine, to keep uh, or to ma maintain their salary. Um, and, and in fact, in, in, some, in some cases, like the uh, dramatically in increase your, your wealth. Uh, um, but it, it shifts the notion of, 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 uh, of, of um, capitalistic uh, the, uh, elites to the extent that, uh, it includes new categories of people amongst those who have or, 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 or immunological or epidemiological privilege. For example, hey, hey, look at uh, look at most of us, like uh, the the academics who can who can tell a uh, who can uh, uh, tell a commute, so to speak, uh, and 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 and, uh, and engage in, in teaching at a, at a distance. Um, whole new categories of of. Uh, of, of elite subjects who are not tied to necessarily uh, um, uh, to the the need to circulate uh, it should be problematized. I, th I really think, and um, you know, as as I really liked what Ed got mentioned when he said that there's this there's this emerging kind of inchoate sense in which the, the sort of the the entire structure of socioeconomic class under new liberal government seems to be shifting underfoot. We don't yet have a, a proper language to, to name the changes, but I, I think by coining, by the most basic act of the sort of like trying to reframe, uh, um, let's say elite, elite status as opposed uh, to, to uh, essential worker mandatory circulation, we're getting to like a step one or two in this process. Yeah, um, thanks, Chris. Uh, that that sort of mandatory circulation, um, and you know, is is also I think 
um, has also been seen in, in relationship to migratory flows, right? That at once we've seen like uh, migrant farm workers continue to work uh, in the middle of wildfires uh, out in California as a kind of, you know, essential worker mandated circulation. And at the same time, the increasing uh, shutting down of borders and, you know, uh, imprisonment and criminalization of, of migrants in detention centers um, and the way that, you know, deportation has worked to sort of uh, increase um, infection rates in various places in Latin America, you know, shows that that kind of that circulation has quite a quite a broad meaning, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and working also dyadically with its with its opposite in in a, in a way. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so you started kind of pointing in that direction, and, and this is the last question that I want to pose for us before we kind of open up to some audience questions that are, are already waiting, and perhaps more that'll come in. Um, and it's the question of the future. Here we are. It's now eight months into this thing. I think we're heading into the you know, the, the end of this year. And, and I just want to ask each of you to reflect on, on where we will be when this pandemic is over or otherwise share with us some of your future oriented thinking, please. Uh, Edgar, I see you smirking and making faces. <laughs> <laughs> you should go. I mean, first of all, I just want to I say that the conversation is so rich. Um, and I'm thinking of Joanna's comments and Chris and Shakti's. And I'm thinking also about like this question of intergenerational dialogue um, and the capture of La Predica Revolucionaria, which I think was this question of propaganda, right? Um, and I'm thinking specifically of go having gone to Sue Rivera's funeral and the connection with Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Jensen, and the Lords, who had a, a, a very warm relationship, right? Although they occupied different structures within the city, different positionalities within the city. And so I, I, I always uh, try to think about the future as a, a type of uh, horizon, right? A horizon. And how we're in, and we're is shifting, right? And people are being taxonomized again who's who in all of this. I mean, at one time you could think about going to Tribeca to the kitty playgrounds and seeing basically women of the global South, uh, West Indian sisters, uh, Latin American sisters, African sisters, taking care of the elite children, right? Of Tribeca and Soho. And there in one sense, immobility, having to be with those kids was the enabling condition for the fabulous lives of those elites, right? That, you know, basically bourgeois uh, desires, white bourgeois desires are articulated through mass un unmet needs, collective needs. Yeah. And because of that, because of that dialectic, you know, that there's this asymmetry at different times, the velocity and motion and circulation changes, right? And now it's stay in place, you won't get this. Go in motion, you will get that. But you must go in motion so I can do this, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a subsidy that's occurring, a subsidy, a material subsidy uh, that's occurring. And I think that, that um, Black Lives Matter brought to me the comments of Kali Akuno and the comrades who are down in, in Jackson, Mississippi. Kali, in an interview after the Dallas shootings, if you remember, um, said something very evocative. He said, I see Black Lives Matter as delayed reaction to Katrina, what happened to folks in Katrina, New Orleans, and the failure of the Obama administration. And I see a continuity and the responses happening now in the mass mobilizations and the repolitization of space, of public space, right, is, is a, a, a harbinger of what's to come. Um, should I be uh, really negative uh, in a dialectical way? I can't imagine armed conflict not happening after November, right? Because it's already happened. Okay? So figuring that piece out is very important. And in terms of the future, um, I think uh, the way I look at it is uh, the future is in the present to, to think about CLR James's piece, right? 
And, and what we've learned in this process is they will kill 200,000 people without batting an eye. What more do you have to see? Mm. Right? So it's not a problem of knowledge. It's a problem of collective praxis. And, and I love the, uh, you know, uh, Shakti's and Joanna's uh, comments because part of that is how do we begin to create a counter hegemony, right? That breaks out into a confrontation with this. And I think it's happening. I think it's happening with a lot of people. And it happens in, you know, Twitter. It happens in all kinds of ways, right? So for me, um, I'm not as worried about the long-term future. I'm more worried about the question of how we're going to survive and flourish under these circumstances. And, you know, I keep on thinking, it always comes to my mind that, you know, uh, in one sense, there's turning points, right? And this is one of them. This is a pivot point. Right. And so we have to begin to, as Chris has said, I think, begin to do a new analysis de la conjuntura. What's the conjuncture of forces? What are our forces? What are the forces against us? Who are people who are not convinced either way? Right. Because you can have fascism with Netflix. Right. You can have fascism, you know, with, uh, you know, all the digital apparatus. So we have to figure that piece out. And it's, it's a rompecabeza, right? Because we're trying to, we're living in the very moment that we're trying to figure out. And I wrote a piece called Health have, Hell Have No Fury, Like a Multiplex Crisis. And my, my old man used to say to me, this is hell, this is hell, at that infierno, right? And, and, and the idea there was that it didn't have to be that way, right? And I think that's what, that's the taste that a lot of people got in those protests. Because to go to those protests and know you can get something to kill you, right? No, ACT UP, we, you know, we had a lot of stuff going on in ACT UP, but the kind of physical courage that I saw in those streets, I was like, no, we've reached a new level. There is a qualitative difference. Yeah. There's a qualitative difference right now. So there's and a potentiality the there. Time, and yet at the same time, a lot of continuity in those practices of care, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. the, those caretaking. Protocols of care, and, right? Protocols and a, of care. And a, and a yeah. really deepening development and, and enunciation of radical protocols of care, of community mm -hmm. uh, care that emerged in those protests as well. And that again, remind me of what it felt like to be in the, in the protest in Puerto Rico in the last summer where people were doing that kind of thing. So we, there was no pandemic at the time, but there was that kind of sense uh, of care, radical care born out of the experience of Maria, right? Where people come by, bring you water. Are you okay? Do you need something? Bring you some food or, you know, um, that care in struggle. That, you know, again, that humid pitch and the, <laughs> and the yeah, slow burn. No, no that's uh, definitely true. And, and then, then the thing that Joanna said about anti-communism, Yes. That stifled us in many ways. And now socialism is something that people can speak of. So that's another piece of the ground uh, mm -hmm. that's important. I mean, I think there's a lot of conversation here that are important. Um, and I'm glad we're having them. And I know that if we're having them, thousands upon thousands of thousands of people are having them outside the academy, outside. And that's our hope. Because the academy, it's a nice job in it, but oh, it's dead on its fucking feet and may not know it. Right. It's like the monasteries in 19th century Europe. They're dead, but they don't know it. Right. So there are new forms of gathering of knowledge production that are occurring even at this moment. Uh, like just like in the AIDS crisis, people had to become experts. People are becoming experts now in epidemiology and taking it to another place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and also opening up of education. I think people are engaging also in, in popular forms of, of study and, and learning. Yeah. Other other folks want to share some future oriented thoughts? Sure. Chris, um, go ahead. Yeah, the, there was a there was a there was a second sort of key term that I introduced in my piece, which I call carceral involution. And one one sentence sort of in, encapsulates its relation to uh, immunological elites, uh, which I think is 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 important to consider for thinking about the ways in which. Uh, carceral logics and landscapes are often invisibilized uh, in, in, in as a mode of governance. So I write uh, in, um, you know, in my article, as immunological elites embraced stay-at-home measures and economically demand, the unflagging circulation of working class providers of essential services, new states of confinement and the circulatory regulation of urban publics 
ultimately inverted the nearly 200 year old popular and legal understanding of confinement is the opposite of freedom. Mm. So, mm. you know, there's something, you know, I've been studying like uh, uh, carceral worlds and, and prison regimes in Ecuador for nearly 20 years now. And, and uh, since 2008, the, the carceral sector grew by 400% uh, from 8,000 to nearly 40,000. Note that this takes place under both neo, uh, like neo-socialist and neoliberal regimes under Correa, as well as uh, uh, Moreno governments. So we've seen a rising tide of penality, rising numbers of, of, of uh, police patrols, more citizen sur surveillance, including importantly digital surveillance uh, that that, uh, that entail you know uh, uh, you know strident critiques against against these processes. Um, and now, now, these, now these measures are being applied to monitor citizen circulation uh, uh, on, uh, on the streets, as well as, uh, you know, find, like finding out who's committed, you know, the, 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 the crimes of, uh, of circulation under, under the days or, 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 or uh, moments like uh, pro prohibited. I mean, we have a quote unquote stoplight system, which, which dramatically scales back circulation depending on the, the level of the state of emergency from red to, to uh, yellow to, to green. But what's notable about all this is the, is the sense in which the uh, logics of civil divestment and, and, and necro, necropolitical rule is being promulgated across the, precisely these, these circulatory measures. And I you know, I, I, I borrowed the term involution from Geertz, who was looking at a different kind of colonial era and, and moment when, uh, it, you know, it, it, like the imposition of a, of, of a set of, of, uh, of external uh, technologies to increase agriculture mapped onto the cultural lives and systems of, 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 uh, of, of, of people in, in uh, the South Pacific. Uh, and you know, uh, um, effectively, it, it's not necessarily sustainable. Breaks apart at the seams, right? Uh, because, uh, 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 well, of, of a number of reasons. But this single technolo technological substitutions at the point of a gun are, are like are are, are like uh, not just an incredible imposition, but they 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 can receive be the recipient of, of incredible like and creative push uh, pushback as people lives are shredded in the process and this is exactly what i think is happening with the with the penalization of uh, of of, um, of breaking uh, quarantine rules throughout the americas I, I the i did my research for this article in guayaquil ecuador which was literally the hardest hit uh, area in latin america i guess beyond we could say New York, which is of course an island of Latin American community in, in the North. So um, I, I, there's a real kinship uh, between what I'm talking about and what Ed got just uh, laid out for all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I'm so glad that, that you brought in that frame um, of the carceral involution. And, and you really, I think you're your contribution, your essay really draws out the ways in which that carceral logic has deepened throughout mm -hmm. this process and, and kind of consumed even more space than, than, it, than it was consuming before. Uh, and I think, you know, Paul Preciado also in, a, in an essay that he published earlier on in the, in the year also was talking about uh, the ways in which that, you know, the body, had, the border is now at the body. Uh, mm -hmm that we, we've all sort of become experts at policing the borders of our body now because of the pandemic and sort of mm -hmm. activated that, that um, carceral, you know, a kind, of, kind of carceral embodiment, right? Um, through the logic of, the, of contagion. Um, so I don't know if Shakti or Donna wanna say something here or if you would like to move on to questions. Shakti, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I am sort of a cynic by nature, and I was despairing to my partner yesterday. You know, we're here in New York City, we're in the Bronx, and, you know, as this sort of horror was unfolding in March and April, you know, one of the things that kept us going was the idea that perhaps this was the opportunity to remake everything, right? that 
this mirror, as Joanna says, that was being held up to, to all the flaws that are, you know, they're not accidents, right? It's not a bug, it's a feature of the system that we live within, that maybe there was a way to see our way out of this mess by, you know, having that mirror brought up to us. And I think if there's something that I, I fear, it's sort of um, a rolling back of the strides that have been made in sort of culturally sensitive, patient-centered care that people like the Young Lords and the Black Panthers, you know, and other radical health activists really fought for and lobbied for, you know, I've seen really well-founded fear on the part of people in my community of the healthcare system. And people really responded to sort of these conspiracy theories around what the pandemic was or, or who created this virus and what it was, is its in intentions. And I think if there's anything that I worry about, it's that, you know, these sort of invasive methods of, of data collection or policing our health and our bodies and how that is sort of intensified on already vulnerable communities will lead to even further distrust, which isn't unfounded, but I fear will, will hurt us in the long run. And so that's a deep concern of mine, even as I understand the logics behind that. Yeah, that's, that's a really important point and it, it connects to, to one of the questions that's waiting for us in the, in the chat. But before we go that route, Joanna, do you want to say something? Uh, yes, uh, briefly. Um, so there's a new generation that ha is growing up in, in this chaos uh, with uh, both the inhumanity of the system and the humanism of the uprisings, people engaged in human, in mutual aid and um, upholding the humanity of the least of these. So there's a, there's a new generation that we are, we have no idea what that consciousness is going to, um, what's going to bloom with, with the consciousness of those folks who've been um, unequivocally transformed at a very early age by so there's a generational um shift certainly in effect um and then there's also a deep economic crisis before the pandemic the new frontier of the economy was in not so very expensive vacations for those of us who work around the clock and are so stressed that we need to go take a week off and we can. So that was the new frontier post 2006, 2007 recession. That was the new frontier of the economy that is collapsed completely will not be resurrected for some time. And even that new frontier in the economy was producing um, underemployment globally. So we're seeing a deep economic crisis um, unseen previously. And, and because this economic crisis is so deep and because the system cannot offer a way out to the majority of people, that's why we're seeing these extremes. We're seeing a neo-fascist um, a current emerging globally, and we see it here. And, uh, um, and then the alternative is seen in what we started seeing in Chile and Latin America before the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, and the uprisings here uh, in the United States and beyond. And the question is, is that alternative going to be organized enough um, uh, effective enough in terms of what it proposes as an alternative um, than the chaos of the far right. And, um, and then there's the question of repression here in the belly of the beast. I'm thinking that Iran and Turkey decarcerated during the pandemic, but the United States has not. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, and that's, that's more a stain on American hegemony than not. 
Uh, so yes, repression is an issue, but all of the repressive forces of the world were not able to keep people off the streets. And we thought for a minute there, as these demonstrations opened up, that people were gonna be trepidatious. And there was been a flood of people. Uninterrupted demonstrations in the United States. And I don't, I, I mean, we have tremendous challenges as usual, the question is always one of organization and capacity to sustain um, a struggle that can offer alternatives uh, and, and defeat the powers that be. And in that regard, I think it's, it's really significant also that we saw reverberations of the Black Lives Matter protests inside prisons and detention centers, right? We saw folks it was very powerful to see uh, migrants in migrant detention centers enter into things like hunger strikes and, and other forms of protest within those institutions in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter protests that were taking place in the streets uh, against you know, the, the murder of, of Black people uh, by police. So I think we've, we saw some really powerful um, solidarity um, uh, you know, some, some efflorescence of solidarities there as well. And, and of course, all of that speaks to the longevity of our movements, the longevity of, of the resistance of our communities, as Edgar also was pointing to um, in reference to his father and, uh, and uh, the sort of long durée of anti-imperialist, anti-colonial um, uh, abolitionist um, struggles. Uh, and how this, this moment has kind of brought all of that uh, into, into fruition in a sense, right? Into the need to sort of elucidate a new political project. I think Joanna's right about that. That's just, there's a, a kind of glaring, um, a glaring need for a, a new political project to be elucidated there. And it, it hasn't happened and it's been institutionally um, killed, right, institutionally forbidden uh, through the um, machinations of the sort of formal political system on the one hand and, um, you know, the systemic kind of infiltration of, of our movements as well. Um, so there's, there's a lot to think about there, um, but I, I want to, I want to invite our, our audience uh, who's been with us here for the past hour and 20 minutes listening to us talk and um, and have shared with us some of their thoughts to, to please um, feel free to uh, put more questions into either the Q&A or the chat. It's a little easier if you put them in the Q&A, it's just easier to keep track of things. But I wanna start with a question that Tamara asked um, quite a while ago, but I think you know, has, has, um, is still relevant and connects to what we were just talking about also, which is what's next in terms of vaccination uh, and the way that people are going to respond to vaccination. I mean, we've seen just this week trials go on pause, vaccine trials go on pause, as well as uh, at least one treatment drug um, go on pause because of um, serious side effects in the testing populations. So, you know, we've seen some, of course, there's the anti-vaxxers movement, uh, but there's also a kind of legitimate questions around the safety of the both vaccinations and I would say treatments being developed. So Tamara asks what Edgar, but I think other folks, if you, if you want to say something, of course you can, but she asked Edgar specifically, what do you think about potential BIPOC and queer resistance to vaccination or not? Um, my sense is that, well, first of all, there's, gonna, there's not going to be one vaccine. There's going to be many vaccines. The timeline to that is very difficult to determine. Uh, I don't think anybody knows, honestly. And, and just like your flu vaccine, uh, the virus is, uh, you know, doesn't mutate a lot, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, SARS-2 COVID, but um, we think. But at the same time, what the effectiveness, the efficacy will be is still another question, an open question, right? So uh, even if you get it, uh, a COVID, what are the lingering effects? What are the what is the expanse of the immunity? How does that work? There are simply a lot of questions, and um, and people have legitimate right to have those kind of questions. Um, I don't know 
I don't know anybody who knows honestly when the vaccine will come out or which vaccines will be more effective. I suggest that people look at COVID lit of uh, the NIH, National Institutes of Health. Um, you know, uh, basically they have all these different articles that come out every day and they're looking at, you know, therapies, they're looking at what happens in different places. You can go to different parts of the world. I would say people should be, uh, op, you know, cautious and discerning and not make any decisions without consulting people who have some knowledge, some healthcare knowledge, right? Um, I myself um, was part of a vaccine trial for HIV um, that collapsed, right? That never, you know, that that that's ongoing, but that collapsed. So I would say to people, um, try not to believe the conspiracy theories. Uh, look at the science as best you can. Uh, it, it's for scientists to make the translational work at the level of popular education. I understand people's apprehensions, uh, but there there isn't going to be. I don't think there's going to be an out out cure. And we have to think about the other piece, which is the metabolic rift. Fundamentally, the accumulation strategies of capital have created conditions under which zoonosis occurs. Uh, uh, people are being exposed, animals are being, their habitats are being destroyed. This is the work of people like Rod, Rod Wallace, you know, COVID-19 in the circus of capital. And that's not gonna stop. This is not gonna be the first global pandemic. The idea that the press is irresponsibly saying a once in a lifetime pandemic is amazing to me. This is gonna continue because capitalism is gonna continue to destroy the planet. And so there's, there's and they may, there may be a vaccine. Hopefully there is, God willing. Um, and, but there's gonna be more pandemics. So this is, this is why it's, it's an crucial time to think through this moment because a whole new set of conjuncture is upon us. Uh, we'll see what happens. I, I teach doctors at, at Columbia, and I'm gonna be teaching a class on race and medicine at uh, USC Keck School of Medicine next semester, in which I will put your articles on the syllabus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I think that one of the things that's important to me is for physicians to be politicized uh, and to be alive. What, what the Lord's understood was the political nature of public health and also what the Lords understood in their conversation with third world socialist movement was we have to create a new international. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is not gonna be a national solution to any of this. And we right. have to and, 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 and of course, climate disruption, climate change, yeah. and, uh, mm -hmm. it, it has been underlying this whole conversation, mm -hmm. right? And, and the ways in which that has also been um, uh, exacerbating the the effects of of racial capitalism of uh, imperialism of uh, extractivism um right and the, the feedback loops there um yeah, no, 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 no. there's a, a question from my sister dr claudia garriga lopez um claudia asks uh, black lives matter role modeled present day interventions of the kind developed by members of the ballroom community described by marlon bailey in his book uh, butch queens up in pumps. They affirmed our need for collective and public intimacy, the, the protested. Through the politics of care, Black Lives Matter protests demonstrated the possibility of taking care of ourselves and each other through low tech and affordable practices instead of the over-reliance on vaccines and medical treatments that will not be widely available for some time. Oh, so I guess that's more of a comment than a question, but the, yeah, it follows up from from what you were what you were just talking about, Edgar. So I've got also um, a comment from Diana who says, "Yes, these governments should address the factors that cause people to go outside and flout these rules in the first place." Uh, and, and and you know, I think I live here in Michigan, so um, the revelation that uh, these these people were planning to um, kidnap the governor of Michigan and put her under some kind of trial um, is, you know, on the on one level, not surprising at all, given that Michigan has long been the seat of the KKK um, and several other paramilitary and white supremacist organizations to whom the president has been speaking directly um, and encouraging them to organize themselves and to prepare um, in a variety of ways to sort of enact his edicts, right? So, so to me, this was some natural consequence of, 
of what he asked the those constituents to do in Michigan, which was to quote unquote liberate Michigan, right? So it, it just it just strikes me as um, sort of terrifyingly ironic because you know we're also talking about liberation, but this um, this this uh, this is a completely different um, meaning uh, and understanding of of liberation, understanding of freedom. So. Um, it's just the stakes are pretty large. It, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. It's pretty high stakes. We have a, an anonymous um, comment, I think. Uh, so it says, also vaccine is biomedical approach, but underlying issues continue. Once again, biomedicine wins versus public health and environmental approaches. Yeah. One of the things that's been most frustrating for me has been the lack of appropriate use of contact tracing, which would have made a difference early on in the pandemic and could have changed the changed the the the, the landscape that we are looking at now. Uh, but there was a complete abandonment of the most basic epidemiological interventions that that were not uh, very high cost that would have made a big difference. And the the situation at the CDC has been abysmal. Uh, I mean, all of the all of the mechanisms of the state that were supposed to be uh, functioning, uh, supposed to be the, the best in the world, you know, uh, have just failed miserably. Um, and so that, uh, yeah, so, but there has been a corporate push. I mean, it's not surprising, but that's what we've seen is a push to kind of, um, you know, have corporate answers. So I don't, I, I don't want to, <laughs> talk too much about it. I think Chris might want to say something. I see him gesticulating. No, no, I'm, I'm just agreeing with you. Oh, okay, okay. I took that as maybe you wanted to say and, something. And I think it's important to say that contact tracing hasn't been practiced in the United States. Damn real. It, that's right. Or in Puerto Rico. Or in Puerto Rico. Damn skippy. That's exactly right. It, I mean, I think that's right on the money. And I think that that would have saved lives and uh, it would have helped in terms of uh, all the possibilities. This was completely preventable. At least this level of death was completely preventable. Um, and there's, I, you know, I'm, although the United States is not a signatory to the ICC, uh, we, I think logically we should go back to the Black freedom tradition and bring them to the UN, bring them to every public forum and charge genocide. I, I don't see any other, uh, the, the actors of the state were genocidal in their neglect. And we need to, people will say, well, that's just a symbolic thing. The hell, you know, whatever means you can use to bring this to the fore of the public uh, arena is important. And we need to, to, to do that. I mean, that's, uh, I think about, uh, yeah, William Patterson, right? I charge genocide, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Robeson's uh, constant uh, focus on the international scene. So we need <clears> to think about that because there's so many governments that are implicated in the Modi in India, uh, this idiot in Brazil, all these folks, you know, need to be put upon charges, or at least with the effort should be made. Right here in New York City. Amen. It's very clear that the contact tracing, even as late as June, July, and August, was deeply flawed here in New York City. It was removed from the Department of Health, where it should have been, and placed within the Health and Hospitals Corporation, which is not standard practice for public right. health. Exactly. I mean, you know, we talk about this sort of federal neglect and these sort of, you know, this national issue of what was owed to us as citizenry and what was failed on. And it's very at the local level too, right? Here in New York City at the center of the epidemic for the US, you know, we have failed very basically. And you can see that with this issue around schools reopening or not reopening. I, I think that part of the issue, A, is that we've abandoned science as a society, regardless yep. of who might be the president of the United States. But also our, our society is organized around private medicine, not public health. Exactly. So any problem is going to be addressed um, very narrowly yeah. and individualistically. Um, yeah. yeah. Which, is, mean, which is the exact opposite of what you, know, what you want to do. In response what you want to, and, and honestly, we need to be careful I mean, I assume Trump will lose in November. Quien, quien sabe, quien carajo sabe. Pero um, I would say that the okie dokie, if the Democrats come in, will be back, right? The okie dokie. And the status quo has been shattered. And we have to be really clear. 
no more toothpaste in the tube, you know. Um, and I know Chris wanted to say something. I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a question here. Um, so uh, Heather asked if I can give an update on the situation in Guayaquil and the struggles yeah, with injustice. That'd be great. Uh, um, right. Well, there, there was, in a sense, a twofold problem at the beginning of, 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 of the outbreak when Guayaquil got hit so badly, which was the, the just sheer profusion of, of, of the dying and the dead, such that both, not only ambulance and hospitals infrastructure has collapsed, but funeral, privatized funeral and mortuary industries collapsed. So you saw people leaving their dead out on, on the streets because it was just too much to bear to have them inside the house for over multiple days with, with temperatures and, and high humidity, temperatures in the, in the 80s and 90s with high humidity. So um, not only did like, uh, like uh, this, this scenario, this nightmare scenario unfold in, in private settings, in public settings, the hospitals were so overwhelmed that, that like all available interior spaces turned into temporary morgues, okay? And, uh, you know, the, and, and security forces of all kinds were called in to, to, to keep people from accessing them, sort of reversing the traditional understanding of the court in Saint Sanitaire zone. Mm -hmm. So effectively, what, what's, what, you know, what, what has happened, in, 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 I, I've addressed in terms of tra the trauma of this experience, of the way in which it, like the city is marked by the memory of the dead and the dying in certain places. Like there was a body left right in front of my favorite coffee shop. How the hell am I going to go to that <laughs> coffee shop and uh, patronize it? You know, these, these, this lovely, sweet sort of coffee shop and, and, uh, and not just be consumed by this by this Im image emblazoned in, into my brain, my mind. Um, but on the other hand, like the, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the chaos of trying to deal with the, the, this massive tri like triage uh, 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 procedure, uh, uh, you know, it, for hundreds of bodies got lost. There were disappeared bo like bodies of the dead in, in Guayaquil. Uh, and th uh, they, were, they remained disappeared for, uh, you know, four months. These are only the numbers of people who, who for, filed formal complaints to human rights organizations. Nobody knows the actual numbers. The, the government, uh, both local and major local and uh, large local and, and central governments uh, it, it hired PR campaigns to like distract from the, the, the sheer numbers of, of the dead and the, and, the, and the case count in order to keep up uh, uh, in order to prop up Ecuador's sort of image as a competent uh, neoliberal government. Um, effectively, uh, you know, what's, what's going on is that the, the numbers of the dead are, uh, of, the, of the missing dead have, have slowly been sort of recovered, but there are still like a, formally over 100, 100 dead uh, that have not been recovered in, in Ecuador and families are struggling with this. They're still holding, they're still holding marches um, amongst other, amongst other sort of act, uh, petition writing activities. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, like the, the, the level of, 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 of protest is, has dramatically in, uh, in, uh, increased on the streets but in, also in front of particular government buildings. And you can see all of this, this uh, sort of effervescence of, uh, of grievances, uh, like bubbling to the, to the surface of social life is something undeniable in, in the face of, of such civil divestment and negligence. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. short story. Yeah, I'm, I mean, again, the, the sort of the mobilizing power of, of, of the experience of, of loss or of mortality, right, um, is, can have, a, can have an, an effect on, on the way in which we're able to uh, understand our connections to others, you know, understand our connection to, to otherwise people that are strangers. But are sharing that are sharing a loss uh, that is not that is similar to the to the one that one might carry, you know. So it it creates these other kinds of uh, kinships almost uh, through those losses, and 
you know, I'm thinking, of course, of, you know, uh, the experience with the disappeared um, in Argentina and Chile and the, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo and those kinds of socialities that are developed also out of the keeping of the memory. Also Ayotzinapa, the disappeared students of Ayotzinapa and the, the kinds of politicization of, of, those, uh, of those disappeared or, or um, uh, lost um, bodies, no, uh, the, that, that can also elucidate a kind of, or have, uh, that also has elucidated uh, a kind of radical politics or a kind of radical demand uh, I, that I see also, you know, for example, in the in the feminist movement in Puerto Rico, where they say, "Vivos los queremos," like we we want them alive, even though we know they're dead. We still we still make the demand that "los queremos vivos," like we don't we don't want them dead, right? That mm -hmm. that the way that you're returning or not returning these bodies to us is not acceptable. It's not enough. I'm not going to even accept that you've killed them. No, that. Uh, I see that also in that in that call from the Zapatista women that I, I make reference to in my introduction to the issue. Um, that was actually in 2018, the the first um, women's gathering in in Zapatista territory, and the acuerdo that came from that, which was simply acordamos vivir, you know. And uh, as the pandemic started happening, it, from that that just um, was resonating in my mind. Uh, in its simplicity, you know that the recognition of how death is present all the time um, for for folks uh, then becomes mm -hmm. also the the root of this affirmation that okay, but we're gonna we're gonna live right. Vamos acordamos vivir, which and then 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 they followed that up by saying, and since for us to to live is to struggle, then we agree to struggle. No acordamos entonces luchar. So um, yeah, so thank you for, for sharing those uh, reflections, Chris. And, mm -hmm. and I want to invite more questions from the audience. If anybody wants to make a comment or, or raise another question, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, and anybody else would like to comment from the panel? One thing uh, that struck me, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I've been talking to a lot of them on this radio show that I'm now hosting. <laughs> In March, the epidemiologist started saying that we were going to have 200,000 dead in September. And that's the exact number we had. That's right. Do right. you shout out the show, Joanna? Hmm? Oh, shout out your show. Do a pull yeah, up, yeah. please. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's called A New Day, and it's on WBAI 99.5 from 7 to 8, Monday through Thursday. All right. So there you have it. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Uh, if folks want to throw their social media in the chat, uh, Shakti, Chris, Joanna, Edgar, please share your websites sure. or anywhere where people can follow up with you, blogs or anything like that, sure. that people can check sure. out. Um, I just- I have a yeah. podcast called Karl Marx Ate My Field Notes. Yes. And <laughs> it's about a radical political spirituality. And I guess one of the things, uh, thinking about mourning and melancholia or militancy and melancholia, um, maybe one thing we could, I think about is all the spiritual practices that people have engaged in to animate their their activism right uh independent of commitments to theism or not but the traditions that they've mobilized to think about these things and to confront because i see the protest as a form of mourning militant mourning right militant tenderness and militant attention and i think that i i, I you know would like to just hear how folks are thinking about that piece as well because there's something animating this that that is really powerful and, and people can feel it. And I think that's what's, uh, that's important for us to recognize that effective and spiritual peace, if you will, that I think is, is there. And we were talking about this a little bit in the other, in the other uh, conversatorio, the other um, Zoom that we had, the one in Spanish. Uh, and it came up around, you know, the, the idea that that George Floyd's death was not unlike many other deaths that had occurred before his, but that there was something about the confluence of the moment um, that his, his killing became intolerable, uh, not only because of its, its own specificity and cruelty that, 
was visited upon George Floyd, uh, but also because of the pandemic and the, the unequal effects of its uh, of its uh, on communities of color, as well as a, the sort of on the intensifying, you know, um, social violence that we see under the Trump administration, etc. So all that confluence of events. Uh, led to people kind of um, coming out on the streets and in uh, in memory of George Floyd or in, in defense of his life in a way, um, and it tapped, but it tapped into you know so many other um, not only so many other people who were then subsequently killed, uh, but even before him, right? I mean, Black Lives Matter has been has been around for a number of years now. This is not a new movement per se. It was just invigorated in a in a new way right, by the kind of mourning that comes from 200,000 people passing away uh, predominantly in our communities, right? So, I mean, I, that's, I don't have anything more brilliant than that to say, Edgar, but I just, you know, that's something that we were talking about last time also, how remarkable it is that, that there was this, this collective, you know, outpouring um, over something that in itself was kind of not unusual uh, unfortunately um yeah anybody else want to say something about that before we start saying goodbye i think that that mortality and uh this is a common theme i mean in the transition from from to he to human we saw that the um, honoring of the dead was central to that transition um, from animals to humans. Um, and I think we see a lot of that celebration of life and honoring of the dead with Breonna Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the stuff of the Iranian revolution in 1979. It was um, the practice of revering the dead in Islam that gathered people in 1979 after they had been killed um, over and over again by the Shah. So I think there's something very powerful of that. We saw that in Ferguson too. Mm -hmm. um, and we see it in Palestine, mm -hmm. uh, the freezing of um, the dead by uh, the Israelis and the ways in which that has mobilized uh, and uh, incensed uh, the Palestinian people. So I, I do think that is a, a, a very important theme that can only humanize all people in the United States. Because we, we, we live in the heart of empire and it's impossible to not be um, affected and desensitized to human suffering. Um, and I just want to read, when you said that, Edgar, I thought of Mark Lamont's, Lamont Hill's um, post uh, after the Breonna Taylor decision was announced not, not to charge the, uh, the police officers. It says, seen, I see you black girl. You'll never be invisible to me. I will burn down cities in your name. Hmm. Yeah, the outpouring of art uh, in represent artistic representations of Breonna Taylor has been really amazing. Also, the ways in which her likeness has been developed in painting and, and drawing and, and almost every kind of, uh, you know, plastic art that you can think of in, in really creative ways. You know, I think people have also tried to kind of um, enflesh the memory, if you will, mm -hmm. right, the sort of make present uh, make present what is absent, you know, uh, in a, in art has been central to that, to that process, as it always is, as it always is. Yeah, Chris, please. Yeah, I'd only add, you know, that, that um, in moments of, of, in moments of, of, of um, in which states embrace emergency measures and new kinds of decisionism are imposed upon Broad swaths of the public for, for yes, for for public health and and and, and private political reasons, but also for, but um, but it's also you know critically important I think to realize that 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 this kind of political theological turn 
is met and arrested by a theopolitics. And it's precisely the space of the city, of the congregation, of, of a communion of different subjects uh, that, that, that really allow for, that allows for a, 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 re, a rethinking of, 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 of society and, and its possible futures, sort of in line with, with what uh, Butler calls, you know, body, the problem of bodies in the streets. But, uh, but also, you know, I think that, that we, we, we become each, we become you know, uh, like a, a, a diversity with guided, guiding similar interests precisely by, you know, um, let's say uh, uh, engaging in more marches than let's say desfiles uh, religiosas in that sense. Like it becomes, it takes on these issue, these kinds of uh, ways of gathering together take on a, a theopolitical resonance, which is probably one of the most effective ways of, of, of undermining state decisionism and the way it divests people of, of their agency. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Shakti, you want to give us any final thoughts? Oh, you got to unmute. Can you yeah. hear me now? Oh. Yeah. yeah. I think much has been made of Brianna Taylor as Antonio. Shakti, you gotta, your microphone doesn't sound right. You gotta. How about now? Yeah, better. Okay. So I was going to say that I think much has been made of Brianna Taylor being an essential worker, right? What, what paths might she have crossed? What lives might she have saved in the midst of this pandemic? And you know, it's been remarked upon also that George Floyd survived COVID. You know, this sort of death sentence being passed on many black and brown men like him only to face another one at the hands of the police. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's something there to think about and reflect on in the sort of connection that we have with each other or should have with each other and how, you know, this sort of biosociality, right? The, mm. the claims that we make on the state, our existence as people whose lives are, are administered by the state, you know, what is lost, right? And what is, what are the failures that are given to us and that this is a gauntlet that black and brown people have to go through, through in life and it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, and uh, I thank you for that. And I, I think having the kind of uh, multi-sectorial conversations that that this space, uh, this journal, and this journal, the process of of putting together this journal issue um, made you know made possible or created. Uh, so it's certainly been important to me to be able to make connections across um, space, distance, and context. And I, I've learned so much from from reading all the different essays and from, you know, from thinking with like, once I read Chris's essay, I was, you know, thinking his, with his frame, looking at, looking at the art that Pato included in your conversation, Edgar, those photographs of, of if, if folks haven't seen those photographs, I highly encourage you to check those out. They're beautiful. And the ways in which that, that brings out this other register um, in, in the conversation around carceral involution and, and, it, and, uh, yeah, the, the the question of elites and uh, just you know it was really wonderful to be able to to pull all those different strings together uh, and uh, and think about these things together and also to think about the Americas more broadly uh, beyond just the question of the influence of the United States but also to think about um, that geography of solidarity that exists as well as the sort of you know mutual vulnerability that exists in terms of our relationships between our communities in, in New York and elsewhere in the United States uh, and in Latin America and Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, as, as I was listening to you talk, I was also thinking about how in, during the summer of 2019, the first thing that appeared in graffiti uh, at, during the protests were people's tr um, testimonies to their dead parents, grandparents, and other relatives who had died um, in, you know, in the days after the, the hurricane in Puerto Rico and whose, whose deaths had never been acknowledged, um, had been denied. Um, and uh, that, that testimony showed up on the walls and in protest posters, people said, this is for you, you know, this is, 
one that really struck me was one that said like this is for my father who was found in his bathroom two weeks after the storm you know and so people were putting that out there on the walls and and sort of you know doing that collective mourning that had been you know denied by the state and and it denied even the reality of it like what chris was talking about in regards to guayaquil the kind of uh the the Tergiversations of reality, right? Um, the, the mediatization of those things. So just, um, so just, I'm just grateful for, to be able to continue to to think this with with all of you, uh, Edgar. You know, uh, I I owe you so much. Uh, Edgar was my professor when I was an undergraduate, so I I continue to learn from you. Just thank you so much. You don't know yeah. you don't owe me a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you my life. My whole you're life. right. You're right. Don't worry about it. You're right. <laughs> Edgar, Edgar set me on my on my academic path in many ways. So yes, that's I, okay. I'm, I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> I have we to can... go to another uh, a book launch. Uh, yeah, thank you no, so much. Thank you for Adriana, being here. Adriana, Heather, uh, my comrades Joanna, Chris, Shakti, David. God bless you and keep you, and we'll see you at the barricades. All right. Take care, Edgar. Ashe, Thank Ashe. you. Take care. Okay. Take See care. you at Thank the barricades. So See you at the barricades. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Joanna, Shakti, Chris. Thank you so much. I want to thank also folks who have been in the audience with us from, from the start. Thank you for hanging in with us. Thank you, Heather and David, for your support. Yes. Don't forget to put your Twitter, your social media in the chat if you would like to share those and I'll hang out for a few more minutes if anybody wants to